right over here to my two good buddies. This is Paul and Andrew. Hey guys, how are hey, you? How's hey, how's it going? Hey, thanks good for to see joining. You, thanks for joining. Hey, we're the save the best for last, right? Uh, okay, last session of the day. I what are we it. talking about today? We're ready to roll. We got five Azure services. How many services are we going to talk about? Seven. That's five. Seven? Oh, wow. Let's do five. I'm excited. You want to do five? I don't know. We can do five. All right. All right. Let right. me start off with the best one. Most uh, favorite. <laughs> yeah. I think Close we'll start, to home. We'll, we'll, we'll lead with, the, I think, the two that are kind of universally applicable and okay. yeah. have a thread through them. Yes. I think one of the goals for today for our talk is we hear from a lot of people. There's a lot of Azure services. We don't know where to start. So we tried to pick five services that we think apply to most .NET developers looking to move stuff to the cloud. Yeah. Okay. Certainly Super not... opinionated. Like, Super if you don't know, yeah. start here. Yeah. Okay. So yep. we're going to tackle some very common scenarios that .NET developers are building today and yep. what services you could really take advantage of right off the bat. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So what's the first one we're going to talk about? Uh, so first thing we're going to talk about is uh, Azure App Service. So we're going to uh, have a sample application that we're going to walk through. Uh, we'll go to Paul's machine first while we're doing this. Okay. Okay. And so it's a relatively simple web application. It has a SQL server associated that it stores login and some basic interaction data with. And then it's going to let users upload images to the machine or sorry, to the site, and then people can see images as they've uploaded. So this is an ASP.NET application? ASP.NET application, okay. uh, core to be precise, core. but ASP. nothing ASP. about core, it that's... Not fancy? Yeah, it could be written Just in either web core app. or... It's not that core No, not that core <laughs> Okay. Not that core Not that core Okay, <laughs> that's a different core right. Um And so the first service we want to talk about is App Service, because when we're thinking about moving web applications into the cloud, your first question is, where am I going to host this thing? What is okay. the backbone of the application? So App Service is great for hosting ASP.NET apps. Absolutely, yes. Okay. Yeah, especially, you know, stateless, front-end applications, web APIs, no-brainer, start there. Cecil actually had a good demo in Scott Hanselman's session today, keynote. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah, he did. Cool. Sweet. Yep. Very cool. Yeah, I think the way we talk about App Service is if you're looking to start hosting application Azure, App Service is where you should start. Uh, you may find in some cases that you grow out of App Service or you have, if you're migrating an existing application, you may have special requirements that it doesn't need. But it would definitely be the place that we'd say, look there first, and only if it doesn't meet your needs, then go somewhere yeah, else. I, I love as a dev, it really lets you focus on your app. You know, Microsoft takes care of the infrastructure, like the OS, the OS patching, yeah, um, IS, patching. Yeah. scaling it, all these kinds of operational things. So you just get to focus on your app. So, it, it, so we should also clarify, like it doesn't yep. have to be a core app. It can be done at framework based app as well. It can right? be done at framework app. In fact, there's well. even like okay. a number of languages for those of you watching. Yeah. There's okay. all kinds of languages that are supported. Java. Yeah. Uh, Java, <laughs> Node, right? Python. And also like yeah. Linux and Windows. So okay. just like expanding. There's, you know, it's the easy way to start with these web applications. Awesome. Uh, we're going to show .NET today. Okay. Yeah. We have Absolutely. a bias. Right? I have a bias. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in the right place. Never guess, Beth. <laughs> Never guess. All right, okay. cool. Let's dig in. All right, so, so do you want to speak to your app, your beautiful image gallery app? Uh, yeah, I mentioned yeah. a little bit, but yeah. as Paul said, um, so if you look at kind of Paul's machine here, yep. uh, you upload images, you can see images you uploaded, and then there's a SQL server associated that holds his login data. Um, and What's we'll that record a big transactions. Because it's, it's all nature. Love it. Okay. Got it? All right. So um, <laughs> looking from the Azure perspective, so I'm going to switch over to the Azure portal. And the first thing I'm just looking at, just like, kind of like a lap around. We'll look at the resource group where we created this. I just think of a resource group like a namespace. For those of you who work in Azure, you know what that is. Um, and we're going to pick this app service. And just to you know, Andrew's point, so many things are just built in. Like, so I can see that Azure is handling the health and the status. I can see it's running. I can see which location in the world it's running. It's in East US right now. Um, get to the public URL, right? Um, but I want to show you some of the cooler things. So. Um, as a cloud developer, I care a lot about moving between different environments and making sure that the configuration for each environment remains intact, but I don't have to make changes as a developer to my source code. I really don't want to have connection strings and secrets right. and things like that in my code. Um, so what App Service does that I really love, um, you just go down to the application settings, and that's basically your set of environment variables. And for each instance of an App Service you have, you would keep the same name, but you could, of course, change the values. Or gotcha. an operator who has the privileges can save, save those values. Um, we'll talk about slots in a second, but even if you use slots for DevOps, the settings are aware of slots. Cool. Yeah. And then a couple other goodies. You know, um, These days, HTTPS, um, SSL, TLS, mm -hmm. super important. Um, we, I think, in the tooling, turn it on by default now, right? We do, yep. Help people get through nice. that. Um, you can set up your own custom domain names, use C names. So there's just a number of things that you actually in 
turns out had to do to have a real web app, and it's just built in That's cool. here. Um, then think about you know it's the cloud, so of course you expect a lot of scale. So the first thing I'd look at is, you know, when you need more resources, you can just simply um, either through the portal or using a command line CLI, you can just add more virtual resources. I was trying to make a new word today. You didn't buy it. <laughs> but I talked about virtual virtual machines. It's kind of like you did. Yeah, yes. okay, more yeah, virtual yeah. virtual machines. You Meta didn't buy machine. it. Um, but you can do that manually. You can also set up auto scale. So there could be a metric, whether it's like request per second or whether it's CPU, memory. You can scale based on those metrics. So as you well. can control it or you can have it decide. You can have it decide. And, and so basically, I'm just getting more and more instances that can handle the traffic. Um, that's what we call scale out. There's also scale up, um, which I just think about as kind of improving your hardware, improving your virtual hardware. Okay. So in this case, what did we pick, Andrew? We think it was an S2. S2, yep. Right. So we got 3.5 gigs of memory, a few CPUs. You okay, know. that's cool. Um, but you know, our guidance is always start with the minimum um, app service plan or basically scale that you need. Mm -hmm. And then um, try to scale out first. Try to use more instances. And then as you need to, then scale up. And then you'll get the best economics from doing it that way. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, cool. What did I miss? Did I miss anything super cool about this? So can you think about it like, OK, there's scalability and there's performance. And if you're maybe hitting a performance problem, then you would probably scale up? That's a good way of saying okay. it. Like if you, um, another way, you know, people talk about solving things through DevOps. So if you just need more capacity, you need more capability to run the workload, then you would scale out. But if the, the minimum requirements of just the service that you built as a developer itself, uh -huh. Um, you might actually need to scale up just because you need, you know, even initially you need that overhead of better hardware, more memory, let's say. Okay. Like if you have a memory intensive app, I, I would go for a higher memory skew. Okay. A, a different way to look at that is depending on the resources of a single request. So if you're doing very computationally intensive stuff or high mm -hmm. memory stuff, as Paul was saying, so any given request that comes into your application needs a lot of resources, that's when you'd scale up. If yep. the issue is simply handling a lots of requests concurrently, then scaling out is going to give you the better yeah. economics. In fact, we were just talking to um, a customer just truly just yesterday, and they're kind of saying, hey, you know, even with four users, I'm actually hitting some problems. I'm hitting some contention. And that's already a sign that either like the, the hardware needs to change or the app needs to kind of be refactored. Right. So you're looking for those kind of signals versus is it more like, hey, when I have a lot of requests at scale, that many requests start to bog it down. Gotcha. Right, so and we'll, you're probably going to tell me later how we could actually troubleshoot those types yeah, of issues, it's too. Like, uh -huh. It's almost like a softball mm. lead into <laughs> maybe. <laughs> it could happen. OK, cool. And of course, it works. this works really well with our tools. So we just made sure that you just have an express lane uh, to build your ASP.NET apps, your APIs, and just push them into Great. app service. Cool. Yeah, so I think it's a perfect segue into, I think one of the other great things about App Service is just the first class integration with our diagnostic tools. Nice. Oh, cool. I um, would expect that. Yeah, so should I take a little run through of that? Please do. Okay, so um, everyone has to know, and you need to know this, Beth, that Andrew actually wrote this application, and he's been trying so to tell me broken. all no, week <laughs> that it's perfect. Okay. okay. So, so, so I told Paul he's been a manager far too long to be allowed to write code any longer. <laughs> And as the manager, that's why I use the data to actually <laughs> balance what you're telling me with what's going on. So let's actually, let's take a look. Let's yeah. see what the data says. Um, all right, so let's look at the overview. Um, so there's a lot of ways that you can get into Azure monitoring. And think of Azure monitoring as the best way to you know, turn the lights on to get metrics, logs, alerting, even deeper application insights. And um, it's really easy to turn that on from a web app. So a web app is intrinsically more of a developer application thing. So we're going to go straight for the application insights. So I'm going to pick okay. that. Um, that's, just, again, part of Azure monitoring, which is built in. Um, we just did this in the last couple of months. We made it easier to turn on what I think of as the best default diagnostics plan. OK. Um, so it collects all the goodies that you probably want by default, but not what too much. What types of things does it collect? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, first thing, we collect you know, metrics and logs. That's standard. But also, we collect some APM, or application performance monitoring data, really meaning things like we look at requests, which is a big part of a web app. We understand request times. We understand requests per second. And there's some really cool things with application insights. It actually knows inbound and outbound dependencies. And there's a correlation that gets added all the way through. So okay. what that all lets you do is it lets you understand the end-to-end -end distributed trace of an entire application. Um, which you can understand from logs. Logs are incredibly powerful. I think everyone uses them. 
but the tracing goes that one step beyond to help you understand full transactions. Cool. Um, also, things that you know we worked on that we turned on. So we have a profiler, helps you get into real low-level detail about you know, am I spending too much time in CPU? Am I spending it waiting? Mm -hmm. You know, waiting for some dependency call. And we have a debugger that lets you collect dumps automatically at low overhead safely and. We'll show some of that too. That's pretty cool. So um, also, there's SQL. Like you can do SQL level instrumentation. Oh, Everyone, nice. okay. especially cool. he likes to blame SQL. So uh, we we'll get to figure out was it really SQL or <laughs> was it your code? Okay, so let's take a look. Um, so we'll look at the data again. That was easy to turn on. All right. So we're getting some metrics by default. We're seeing some failures. That could be user error, Andrew. Don't worry about it. <laughs> um, and then there's response times and things like that. Um, some different users using it. So let's just look at the most basic things we get out of the box. We have a search. All right. So let's just look at all the data, all the logs, all the telemetry coming in. And here we go. We're getting all kinds of things. Like we're seeing requests. We're seeing trace messages. It even understands there's some outbound dependency calls into blobs. Cool. That's some of okay. that APM tracing yeah. I was kind of talking about. So this is really cool. It's powerful. You can search. Like I could search just on... Um, you know, exceptions, right? Um, also, everything you see here, this is kind of the easy view, but mm -hmm. you can open it up into analytics. We have this really powerful analytics platform that can search across all of the monitoring, all cool. of the application, even the security data, and you can query and make very specific insights. Ooh, really custom queries. Yeah, really, really custom deep. queries. Okay. And then that's the kind of thing, I think in our team rooms we do this, we, we make the queries that make sense for our teams, um, and we put them literally up on the screen, and it's something we watch all day mm -hmm. to kind of see how we're doing. That's cool. Right, so it's our metrics or our goals for the team to keep those things working well. So whatever's important to you, you can create a query and yes. monitor it. Okay. Now I have to say, I still have no evidence yet that there's any actual issues with the app, so so far. I would assume exceptions I think Andrew's, might be a clue. Andrew's winning, you know, he's winning <laughs> the argument. Um, so let's go to the actual failures. Okay, so we have some we have some errors that have been happening over the last 24 hours. Let me change the filters. Um, hmm, we have 21, 500 errors in the last day. That just, I think 500 is what, internal server error? Yeah, it that is. It could be yeah. anything. Could right. be anything, Paul. Could be totally anything. <laughs> um, Infrastructure probably crashed. And he had all, all day, <laughs> by the way, to make sure this thing had no bugs. <laughs> just remember that. All right. Um, so what we're doing, we're looking at this exception here, and we're seeing there's an unhandled exception at the, you know, the controller or the page that does a right watermark. Um, so that was the part, like you took images in, you put the, your nice little watermark below. Um, now, does IES do that or does your code do that? That would be my code. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, double check. <laughs> All right, so we have a null reference exception. There is no object reference. Any ideas what this could be? Uh, I'll, you need I'll, more information? I'll the, I'll, I could use a little more information. What else can you tell me? Okay. Um, well, we could actually open up a full debug trace. Like, there's actually a dump of this that was set aside. I would love to see a dump of this. Okay. You might convince him. He's he's grasping right now. Okay. So, so basically, you're saying that App Insights will take an automatic debug snapshot when an exception occurs. That's right. It's and it's not. Um, it's it's a little bit less aggressive than every exception because that would okay. that'd be wild, right? It, right. Um, if you think about a mini dump, even a mini dump is kind of like taking all the memory on your machine and just pff, very quickly, like 10 right. milliseconds, setting it aside, which is safe, right? It's yeah. even safe in production, but you don't want a lot. You of don't it. want to be wasteful about that. Right. Right? It's okay. chewing up storage and CPU. So um, we have a like a collection plan, a collection strategy that looks at a certain number of exceptions that we've seen. Let's say we see over five of the same type. I see. Then we would go and take an exception, uh, or sorry, a dump. And then after we collect that dump, we're kind of like, well, we've seen that one, so maybe we shouldn't try to keep collecting the same one okay. over and over again. So there's some things like that in okay. the collection plan, and that's all configurable. Gotcha. But we have a default plan that, you know, we try to make sure that law of averages over 24 hours, you're going to see a good distribution of exceptions, and you're going to see, you know, representative dumps from that. So let me ask you a question. Is it is it better just to turn this on by default and let it do its thing, or it, you should you only turn it on if you're starting to notice problems? You have both options. Okay. Um, I like to put it on, because it's one of those things, it's, you know, hindsight 2020, you start right. getting exceptions. Um, who knows what the context was? Like, there's, there's easy things to debug, like, you know, logic errors that it just were always there, okay. or like a config error, 
or a missing dependencies, like those are going to break fast, and mm -hmm. you'll you might have a good idea from the logs. And that, I would I would never try to debug those things. Yeah. But it's more like, hey, at two a.m., something weird's happening, and it goes down. Or some of my users, maybe who are in another country, they're reporting issues, and I have no idea how to reproduce that. And that's when a debugger is incredibly useful, right? Because you get this guy, by the way, worked on designing the debugger, um, but you know you get the context of the all, everything coming in, like the local variables, right. the parameters, and that actually helps you understand, oh, it was this data point. So it's not just what broke, it's why it broke. So you're saying you can open these right up in Visual Studio, right from here? Yes, you can. So okay. here, like, you get this web view that everyone has. It's lightweight. You don't need a dev environment. But you just download the snapshot, and it's basically what the mini dump plus symbols, and what am I missing? Yep, it, yeah, it's mini dump and symbols, really. So Some metadata about it's, it. It's going to be big, just to warn you. It's the full copy of the process memory, which gives you the full ability to inspect and see what's going on, as Paul was saying. But, you know, what we had a 3.5 gig server, so that mini dump's probably going to be 2 gigs, at least, depending on what the application is doing at the yep. time. So the cool. web portal is definitely the place to start. You experiment around, you look, and when you're like, I really need to know, need to really drill in, that's when you want to kind of do that next step of leaving the browser and bringing that down to Visual Studio. Yeah. Cool. Um, and just to kind of cut to the chase, so so I could open it in Visual Studio, but mm -hmm. like, actually, I think I have enough to go on here to ask you a question. So the username is null, and then we're, <laughs> we're sort of, we're sort of croaking on the right watermark, so any more ideas? Yeah, so I looked at the code while you were <laughs> drilling into that. Um, I'm, as part of the watermark to make sure that we know who things came from, I'm actually stamping a hash of the username into, into the watermark. Yeah. And it looks like I had a slight logic mistake. Um, it's actually, it actually really, wasn't that the day the intern worked on the code? It wasn't you? No, it's actually really, it's a security feature. <laughs> okay, it's a security um, so feature. So what happened was I, I actually, I'm accidentally letting people who aren't logged in upload images. And you shouldn't be able to upload if you aren't logged in. So okay. I'm really just saving the service. Oh, that's good. And you're saving the company money. I am. Thank you. <laughs> good guy. Um, although I will, I will fix the application to not let people who are not logged in upload, uh, upload, and then we should be we should be safe. That's and nice. we should fix that image. So just that, that gives you a taste of you know what it takes. Like we use logs, we use metrics to investigate failures, and then when you really need to, when you're in trouble, there's things like the snapshot debugger for dumps where you can okay. just cool. do that deep analysis. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can analyze the performance. And so one thing I like to do is I open up this perf blade. I like to sort by count. So you can kind of sort from most frequently used APIs and controllers and That's pages cool. to least. Just to understand what's representative of your usage. Um, also, average, you know, it's good, it's bad, it's average together, it's eh. So I, I'd, <laughs> I'd rather use percentiles. <laughs> okay. I should patent that. Um, <laughs> it's so it's like we'll take the median just being like the middle one from the distribution. And now we can look again. We're saying, okay, so people just viewing the home page, you know, 44 milliseconds, it's decent. Um, ooh, like this upload's taking 12 seconds. Okay. That's something yeah. we're going to want to look at. And, you know, the cool thing is we debate all the time about the app. You know, I bet there's people seeing things slower than what we see. But you never really know. And now with this data, you actually know. It's pretty cool. Like you see the full distribution of what's going on, and then you can pick one. That's really cool. That's pretty deep. Actually, there's a question out there that's sort of related here. Yeah. Um, so there is. Is there any way for App Insights to detect a new recurring issue with a build and send a signal to that Azure DevOps to roll back the previous build? So would that be something like, could you detect a problem and maybe switch back to the other slot or something like yeah, that? Yeah, you can do that. So okay. there's. So just in Azure monitoring all up, there's. Um, there's metrics, and then there's basically actions that you would take. take so okay. one action would be an alert. Okay. That's probably the most common. You could send things to your instant management system or to emails or pagers or things like that. Um, but also, it provides a hook where, let's say, in your DevOps pipeline, mm -hmm. to take that, that person's question, that would be the signal of, hey, I'm, I'm throttling my rollout. At this point, I'm seeing the event that things aren't looking good, so therefore, I'm going to branch off and I'm going to, you know, Roll forward is probably what you would right. do. Roll, roll back, roll forward right. um, to a version that worked. Okay. Um, and so um, that scenario isn't completely automatic. Okay. But like I would, what is automatic is the metrics and the alerting and the events. And then just in your DevOps pipeline, you'd want to hook that event. Got it. Um, and I'm sure like we'll be looking to add a fully automatic scenario like that. That's cool. As soon as we can. That's very cool. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so just to to keep noodling on this, so. 
So the get is like viewing the home page. The post is, is the upload. Is that how I think yep, about it? Yeah, post is upload. OK, cool. And if we look at that, you know, we see this distribution. We had kind of agreed, let's focus on what the mainstream customers are seeing. And see all these triangles? This says that not only did we measure those requests, but we actually got profiles. And the profile gives us that deep level analysis. Um, and uh, I feel like performance engineering is, is tough. Right? So we want to just make it a bit easier. Um, so the profile, we've been automatically collecting um, samples with full profiles. And mm -hmm. you can see we have some that are 17 seconds. That's the worst one. All the way down to this median, right? We saw the median was around five seconds. So let's go here. Let's sort by timeline. And then, Andrew, I'm going to need your help to analyze this. So it looks like we're spending a lot of time awaiting, kind of like awaiting for the CPU. And then the code you're actually running your code looks like it happens in the very end. So like, how, how do I think about this one? Yeah, so I, th I think what's going on here, and I took a look at it, kind of drilled in, clicked around the traces a little bit more while, you, while you're looking at this on my machine, yep. is while it, when the user uploads the image, we do some processing on it uh, before we put it up. And so when we get multiple users uploading, they kind of, those requests are stacking up. And so that block time is they're waiting to get their turn with the CPU to process that image. Okay, now do, do you have an idea of why this method might be blocking, right? Like leaving us in a blocked mode, so there's a, a contention. Well, the issue is to process the image, we need the CPU. Okay. And, you know, there's, I think our plan, we have two cores on our CPU, which means that if we get two, more than two concurrent requests, okay. or two requests before it takes time to process that image, then we just have to wait till the CPU frees up before we can actually. So one, are we trying to do too much in this web app post? Uh, that is probably probably the right way to fix this. I don't know that I can make the code any faster that actually processes the image. Okay. So probably it's more the, like rearranging, re yeah, refactoring. Yeah. So I think, I think the right way to fix this from a performance perspective would be to tweak the architecture of our application a little bit and offload right. the processing. Do we have time to try this? Could he try to refactor it? Yeah. Let's it do it. What, what are you going to use right, another Azure service machine. to do this one? I am going to use right. another Azure oh. service. Thank oh. you, Ben. Nice. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, we'll come over to my machine now. Okay. Um, so real quick, uh, what I have up here is just a small architecture diagram of the application as we have it so far, yep. which is an ASP.NET Core web application that's using a SQL Azure database to store user information and when user upload, users upload images, things like that. And we're storing the images that users upload in Azure Blob Storage. So we promised you five Azure services. We've talked about four so far, <laughs> right? App Service, Application Insights, Azure Monitoring, uh, SQL Azure and Azure Blob Storage. And we just flew by storage and SQL. We, we flew like, by, yeah. <laughs> you, everyone knows SQL. It's like it's we flew by we storage. We have a database. Yeah, yeah, we flew by storage and SQL. They're incredibly yeah. hard, but you can take it for granted because yeah. it's SQL. Yes. We talk yeah. about them like air and water. They're you know yeah. you need to store files, and that's what storage is there for. SQL Azure is built from the same source code that the SQL you would run on premises is. So it's if you're familiar with those things, not like we need to spend a lot of time touring them, but be right. aware that they're available. It's your relational database in the cloud. It's yep. your relational database. And they run the at cloud. scale, and they're yeah. backed up for you, and okay. like really good things like that. Cool. So, all right. So yep. I just scroll down, and so what we're looking at now is an architecture diagram of what we want the application to be. Mm -hmm. And so what we're going to do here is we're going to introduce Azure Functions as our fifth service. And so Azure Functions are event-driven code that are going to dynamically scale outside the context of my application. And so in this case, the event that we're going to use is uploading the image. And so when the user uploads that image, we're just going to pass it directly through my application. I'm not going to process it at all. I'm going to stick it in a new container that's like a queue for waiting to be processed. I'll actually move the code that does the processing of the image, we call it watermarking, into a function that will then run independently of the application. When it's done, it's going to move that over into the blob store that my application actually reads and serves the images from when a user looks at it. Gotcha. Okay. So I hate to admit, I've been, so I've been around for a while, and I've seen this kind of queue pattern where you have workers and web. Is that is that basically what you're doing? This is the modern way to do web worker with queues? Exactly. Oh, okay. That's yeah. Good. So um, yeah. Good way to explain it. To okay. use a you know, yeah. kind of very buzzy term, not some people yep. might debate. This is exactly what we're doing, but we're trying to more microservicize the app. We're taking the idea of watermarking. And we're moving that out of sort of being, instead of being this one big application that does everything in your process, yep. exactly, we're going to put it in a queue, we're going to let yeah. that worker that, pick it up. The end user doesn't it. want to wait around for the right. upload and the processing of the image. They just want to, boom, send it right. going. So that feels very asynchronous, very fast. Now he's got a beefier service that can scale infinitely, right? That's cool. To go, you know, chunk on those images and do his watermarking. That's the theory. Yeah. yeah.
All right, so I want to start off by uh, just talking about how we would add an Azure Function project here. Uh, I have one created, so we'll move over a second. But in the new project dialog, we have a cloud node under the Visual C Sharp mm -hmm. node. And so Azure Functions is the second project in there. Yeah. And so when I select that, it would pop up. It would let give me options for the various trigger types available. I mentioned it's event driven, so there's a lot of good logic built into the Azure Functions runtime uh, that lets me automatically wire up and trigger. And the runtime does all the heavy lifting for me about creating the objects and things like that. So we'll show that here in a second. I'm going to go ahead and cancel out of this and hop back over to my our application in Visual Studio that's ready to go here. Is that? Okay. Um, Good to know. So, <laughs> so I have an Azure Function project here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce uh, two images. So one is going to be an image or a function that's going to trigger when the image is uploaded. Let me unpin this real quick into my queue. So what the application will do is the application said we'll put it in a, in a holding blob, blob yeah. container. That's the word I couldn't think of right there. And you can see functions. This is the okay, only a holding pin. A holding pin. There you go. <laughs> okay, perfect. Uh, and so it's the Azure jail. <laughs> the storage <laughs> jail. <laughs> the code that we're looking at right here, uh, it's all um, attribute driven. So I can see that I have an attribute here that's blob trigger. And it's mapping to uh, the container named images. And then my out container, which is indicated by this file access dot write, or my out stream, is you know, just also then the images hyphen watermarks. I mean, it sounds like a lot of machinery, but what I kind of see is there's a, a couple attributes that just say, this is my, this is the storage queue I care about. And it's doing all that pipeline ingest, you know, output for me, right? Exactly. And that's, that's what I wanted to point out. I don't yeah. have to do any, you know, there's no code in my application at all about reading or writing from storage. The functions runtime is going to take care of that on my behalf. That's cool. So that's I'm going to nice. go ahead and hit F5 to start debugging this particular application. Uh, um, so I'm running this on my local machine because in Visual Studio we have a full local copy of the Azure Functions runtime. Same thing that's going to run up in the cloud if I want to develop it locally. Uh, right, you get rich debugging, just the tight inner loop that you've come to expect from Visual Studio and .NET. And just to prove that it's going to work like we expect, I have Storage Explorer here. And so what I want to do is I want to copy, drop an image into my queue that I'm listening to, and we're going to watch the breakpoint get hit in Visual Studio. So, so that's your trigger. That's my trigger. So I have my blob containers here. It's the here. drag and drop trigger. <laughs> drag and drop trigger, exactly. And then we'll, we'll test this working out in the cloud. So let's go to my pictures folder. Let's take this nice little green picture. I'm so creative. Drop that onto my queue. It's going to upload that. Very and then when I come back to Visual image, Studio, right? <laughs> yep, I can see that my breakpoint's been hit here in Visual Studio. I can see that it's going to give me the name of it. It's green.png. And so as I hit F5, it's going to go ahead and process that. And then if I go back to my... Uh, Storage Explorer here, and I refresh, I'm going to expect that my second, so I had a second function that when I finished processing actually took care of deleting the old copy. Oh, and there we go. My delete one just got hit. So I had left a breakpoint in there originally. So I hit F5, and that's going to finish. And then we go back to Storage Explorer. We refresh the, the holding queue, and it should be clean. It's been deleted. And we go to our images watermarked uh, container. We're going to see that we have green.png has been uploaded. Sweet. So I've been able to, right, I have that wired up. Mm -hmm. And so now on my application, let's go ahead and test this in the cloud, Paul. Yeah, I'd love to see it. Um, we don't need to run it locally. But what I want to do is I'm a little worried about messing up our production site. Obviously, you and I are banking our retirement on this photo gallery app. Uh, we are. Succeeding. <laughs> we nearly broke everything before this, too. It was awesome. Um, and so what I want to do is I want to create a deployment slot. So we've talked about slots right. a little bit. And I think this is one of the really killer things in app service. And so what a deployment slot lets me do is it lets me create another place to push a copy of my code in app service. And then I can publish my application to that without affecting the regular site. And then I can go run tests against that. And then if I want, I can even then start routing a certain amount of traffic to that. Cool. So I've already created a, so I would create a slot here. So I'm going to call this one blue because I've already created a slot for this one. So we don't have to watch it. That's copy like the, the deployment strategy. It's like blue, green. You're saying I could have... Yep. I could swap back and forth. Blue, green, pro test, prod, you know, kind of whatever you want. Stage. And then yeah. as you were yep. showing the app service settings a little bit ago, 
I can choose what I want to do from a configuration. Do I want to clone my configuration? Do I want to share my con connection strings? Or do I want to have my own copy and potentially use different storage in a different SQL server here? Uh, for the purpose of this, I'm pretty confident in the quality here. So let's go ahead and clone just our regular environment. We'll run against the same storage and the same SQL. That's not a problem. And then from Visual there's a question too. Yeah, I just was, I just uh -huh. wanted to let Andrew finish his sentence. But he, you know he's what, just Paul, going, if you want to be him, the host, let's that's let him, totally cool. I'll oh, just sorry. leave right now. Sorry about that, Beth. <laughs> what, what's our question, Paul? Let me, let me go turn. Go ahead, Paul. I'm going to turn no, my go head ahead, this Paul. way. Read the question. All right. Practice. Sorry. It's good. That's it. Go ahead. So, Andrew, um, Beth and I would both like to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you know with function apps, what like is their roadmap for developments? Deployment slots? Yeah, Is do we have some... deployment slots with functions? Uh, deployment slots are already supported in functions. Oh, okay. Sweet. Cool. Even better in the so roadmap. So it's, it's like GA and ready to go. It's like GA and ready Ooh, to go. There you, you go. You can do it. Uh, Icky yeah. biked. I love, love the handle, by the way. You are ready cool. to go. We've got deployment so icky slots. Icky bite, Yuki, Yucky. You are Yuki. Yeah, Icky, Yuki. Icky, Yuki. Cool. Yuki. cool. Thanks, like Icky bite. Yeah. So the first thing I just want to show is how to publish to a deployment slot from a developer perspective. And then obviously you can wire all of this up through a CI CD pipeline as well. But when I right click publish on my application and I choose, um, I'm going to pick a new target. I'm going to choose select existing. And then in the group, once it loads my subscriptions, I'll be able to browse and you'll see deployment slots. So this is Azure AI 2018. This is the resource group Paul and I have been using. And I have deployment slots. And I can see blue and function here. I'd already published a copy of this to the function, so let's go. You guys might have just updated that too, because I remember I used to have to download a published profile or something. Right. To, to yeah, you this. used to have to download a published profile from the portal. You can yeah. always, uh, that's cool. if you do that, that's still a supported thing. So we have the import profile button uh, right here. But yeah, you can just target a slot via that, that browsing as well. VS knows slots now. VS knows slots, that's, that's correct. That's cool. You have to create it from the portal, but once it's created, you can pick it and browse to it. So. Um, and then once I, so let's click on this, um, this is blue, this is function. And so this is going to be the function based implementation we just stood up. And so what we'll see here is once it loads, I'm going to click on my, uh, I have another URL and it's going to be exactly the same URL that we had before, except I have the hyphen slot name on the end of it. And so this is our function based implementation and it looks like it loaded and worked correctly as I would expect. Uh, Application Insights is already picking up the data from it because we have it on the site. So Paul could go look at those metrics right. and check it out. And then we and we were just clarifying this: like the mo monitoring in App Insights works across all slots by default, right? That is correct. That's okay. cool, and it lets yeah. you know which slot. There is metadata, okay. so you can right. filter. Very cool. Yep. And then, um, well. I'm not sure. So the last thing I want to show is if we go over to the application insights. Did you show the app map earlier? I forgot. I, uh, I was on my roll then. <laughs> so there's a, something called an application map. And because we put our function app and our app service in the same application insights resource, yeah. you're gonna, it's going to automatically be picking up and monitoring that function as well. Cool. And so on my application map, which is going to load right here, um, once it eventually loads, so the map is sort of like your architecture of all the services? Yeah, the map yeah. is going to look very, uh, sorry, I'm kind of a, in a weird zoom uh, state here. When we were first but, building, just a quick story, we, were, we had talked about that. And a lot of times when you diagnose something or when you, you know, onboard a new team member, I think a lot of us, we go to the board. Yeah, right. right. We draw a picture, maybe someone's done a Visio or something like that. And um, we thought it would be cool for developers to have that as a way to conceptualize what's going on. But then overlay the telemetry that's live over it. That's cool. Um, another cool thing is you really, and keep me honest here, I don't think you had to change your app at all to get that. I didn't. It just worked. It just worked, right? Because So basically, including Application Insights, it's tracking these inbound, outbound requests that rebuilds. That's cool. The topology for wow. you. Wow. Smart. Yeah. So it's actually, it's truly the truth. Like, sometimes we even draw the picture, and then you, you look at the data. It's like, ooh, we didn't quite do what we intended to do originally. So. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. But you can see the function. It you validates can see, your architecture real time. It validates, yeah. <laughs> and you can see, I mean, you can see the. Yeah. It looks kind of like the. Yeah. I'm doing it again. OK, we'll go ahead. That's all right. This I get is, so excited. This is Paul's bread and butter. Paul designed the app map. Uh. I'll give him the, uh, give, give him the call out there. Uh, but um, you forgot to talk about it. It's they don't always now. let me out of Redmond. You know? yeah. What am I going to say? 
especially uh, to Vegas. But yeah. we, we can see the we can see the slot here. One, two, three, four, five. We can see the original instance that we have stood up here. All my fingers. We can see our function down here. So it's picking up everything and automatically building. The, we can see our SQL Server. We can see our our blob storage. And so just by turning on Application Insights on the resources that we wanted, it's automatically building that architecture diagram. And we can see performance data overlaid. We can see that 19% of the calls are failing. Like all of this information is overlaid. So to Paul's point talking earlier about why it's a good idea to just turn it on by default, it puts you in a world where instead of being reactive of, oh, people are complaining about a problem, mm -hmm. you can go be proactive and watch are there particular connections that were a problem, are there times yep. that are problematic, it, things like that. I find like once you have that data to it, 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 yes, it helps with troubleshooting, it helps with keeping your customers happy, but also you learn a lot. Like, okay, I had an idea about how people were using my service or my app, but I really know. Right. Like, I really know for sure, and I know in detail. So it's, you know, That's actually it's, really cool. So there's a yeah. question here that I want to ask you. No content has a question. Uh, can you use Application Insights outside of Azure hosting services so that you only maybe write logs and dumps to Azure? So that's a great question. So you, can you use App Insights outside of Azure? Yes, you can. Yeah. So um, an application can just include the App Insights um, instrumentation engine or SDK um, in the application. In fact, for a number of years, we did that in Visual Studio Desktop right. itself. Uh, so it, it's totally possible. Um, and then at that point, you're using the Azure service as your data and analytics store. Okay. Right? And your, your app still resides on-prem. Mm -hmm. um, what does not work today is having the whole entire thing be on-premises. Okay. So like having the data storage and the analytics on-premises too. I see. So that's, that's not yet. Okay. Yeah. So you want the cloud to do the deep analysis of, the, of the, those dumps right. basically. Which is actually right? a pretty yeah. good usage yeah. of the cloud. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. That's a great, that's a that's great a really thing to mention question. because, you know, yeah, if you can't move the production app with, you know, the deployment, yeah. you can still take advantage of these Azure services to do some monitoring. Yep, right. absolutely. Analysis. You know, and another thing, I think we both have come to encourage this a lot too, like always, in addition to App Insights, still pay attention to your logs. Make sure you're emitting really good logs. And for I can think about for those on-premises scenarios, you always at least have co-located logs with you. Okay. And then there's further analysis that you have in the cloud, and I think that's just a great combo. Right. That's actually a great combo. So we've been you know, talking a lot about analytics and Azure uh, app service and functions and storage. Um, so those are sort of like right, some very common scenarios that you would use like uh, architecture on premises to move to the cloud. What are some like, like we don't have to demo them, but what are some additional services that you can only get in Azure that you just wouldn't be feasible on premises at all? So I think one of the really killer ones in Azure, which we didn't talk about, but is Cosmos DB. So Cosmos DB is a database that Microsoft's designed. They built from the ground up, designed to run in the cloud. It has incredible performance. It's a non-relational database. So it lets you really just work with objects in your code. Objects, okay. documents. You know. Yeah. And, and it'll, from a performance perspective, there's things that you would have had to work really hard to break it up to get it in a relational model to help SQL perform well. But Cosmos Was that called like nth degree normal or you have to know yeah. all that stuff? Indexing. And didn't they release like a .NET SDK or something like yeah, that? Yeah, it's yeah. really easy to yeah. work yeah. Uh, read and write to Cosmos. Okay, uh, from cool. Since you're on the topic, I think the, the work they've done around consistency and replication of the data is, is truly incredible. Like you can, you know, you can have eventual consistency, guaranteed consistency across a lot of locations. It's, um, it's pretty amazing. I, I can't even imagine trying to build that myself. It, it truly, like you said, it would be just not feasible. Right. It would be impossible. Right. Yeah. Awesome. Well, these are um, some fantastic services, honestly. Um, so I think that we've kind of hopefully <laughs> gave you guys a good show here of some common services you should definitely check out at least and take advantage of. Uh, we didn't really talk, like Ed talked a little bit more on the DevOps side. That's another, mm -hmm. another way to go too is if you're not ready to deploy to the cloud, you can at least try some dev test scenarios you definitely. can do in the cloud. We've had, we had these yeah. cool lab scenarios. Yeah. Did, it, yeah. did that get shown? Yeah, yeah so I don't can, know if that got shown, but that's I like, wanted to mention You can mention even have that. your dev environment or your test environment just in Azure, and that's a like that's a, a safe step right. into the cloud. Kind of decide if that's a good working model. For we you. also have a website, you know, AKMS uh, migrate to the cloud. WAC migrate to the cloud. Yep. I, I think it's been in the chat room actually. So yep. that has a lot of great resources on just like, hey, you know, how do I move? And it talks a yeah. lot about my app front service end, there. my data. Yeah, yeah, app service is really yeah. what we recommend. But right. also containers are really helpful too. To if you need to preserve those dependencies, it's 
really That's helpful awesome. as well. Yeah. And if you uh, use your favorite search, search engine and search for .NET Azure, the top result, and I think all the major search engines, is what we call the .NET Azure Developer Center that will have quick starts to all the things we showed and talked about as well as extra resources. Very cool. I think that we're building some learning kind of plans that you can actually like work right with Azure right in the through the browser and, oh, and do different things, right? So that's a good way to actually yeah. check out without, I think, you know, try before you buy. And I want to hear, you know, are these the five services? We arm wrestle about all the time and I always lose, by yeah. the way. Yeah, but, let us know. Um, but he's right. right. And, but if, you know, if you want to hear something else, please tell us. Absolutely. We want to make it better. All right, guys, uh, this is the wrap of the show. I mean, you guys, you guys hit the finale. It was awesome. Thank you so nice. much. We made it. Thank you, All Beth. Right, it was a really Thank fun you,